Thanks a lot for all the veterans who have joined here on World Heart Day 2020. Today we will be discussing a very important topic, COVID-19 management in cardiac care during COVID-19. It's very pertinent that we discuss this topic today and particularly on World Heart Day. I would like to welcome all the panelists, Dr. K. M. Cherian, cardiac surgeon for Frontier Lifeline Hospital. Thanks a lot, sir, for taking time and coming in. And uh, Dr. Balbi Singh, chairman, Car cardiac science, Max Healthcare. And Dr. I am lead consultant with nineteen management and with cardiovascular disease. But the first and observation always remains very helpful. So I really want to, uh, you know, ask uh, the panelists here. First of all, what have been the experience you have seen in the initial stages of lockdown when the pandemic had hit us? How you have seen how it has got better now? The pattern, if you could just tell me, uh, in regards with you know dealing with this pandemic with the cardiac, you know, uh, patients. Dr. Kane Cherin, your thoughts, please. Please unmute yourself. So you have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourselves. It is not the question of muting, it is my voice. Can you hear? No? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Please go on. Ah, okay, okay. No, I am saying that uh, I should not be sitting here because I have no idea about this. The, the only experience I have is regarding my wife. Unfortunately, she died last month from COVID. So that is what I was telling Ganesh and OP that uh, the management of COVID patients is little different. The reason is this is a new disease for all of us. You know, so I, I was just saying that 44 years I have completed in India as a cardiac surgeon. Now, how many people do we have with experience in treating COVID patients and especially in cardiac surgery? Very, very few. Everybody avoids. The reason is their own safety. Even, you know, why I'm taking my wife as an example is, I could not see her the last moment. They wouldn't allow. You have to have the PP kit, that, this, all sorts of you know, hyperbaric. It is very difficult. So this is a new new disease about which we don't have much idea to talk about. I mean, especially me. You know, from the surgical side, I'm sure that that may be the same experience with uh, Ganesh also or OP also. So it's really not a surgical problem. But it is a surgical problem because people try to 
avoid surgery. Just now, why I got a little late is we had a patient, 57 year old lady, who had an angiogram done, for whom we had to clear naturally COVID test, negative angiogram done. She has got 95% left me. So what are you going to do? And a very, very small right. Severe and angina. So she needs surgery. Luckily, she is COVID negative. But still, there are a lot of things which we have to look after. So, in general, if you have got four theatres, three theatres or five theatres, we have got five theatres. We operate only in one theatre. Other theatres are kept empty. So, planning the strategy, explaining to the patients, the relatives, the risk of surgery, the risk of surgery in the sense you know, it is mainly one. How a uh, fear factor you also you can mention how is been if so oh. Oh. So you have completed your uh, th thoughts, sir, hmm? Dr. Sherry. No, I'm just saying that if you have got five theaters, yeah. you are using only one theater, all the other theaters are empty. Kept empty. Mm. And putting on all these things and trying to operate is a big, big, big headache. Mm. And then you have to look after a big team. You have to take the protection in a, all what is possible for your teammates. Seven people, eight people. So that is totally different from dealing with a cardiology. So it is different. Very different. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, if I go back to uh, Dr. Uh, Dalvi Singh Ji, up, uh, you can just uh, tell us about the, how have you seen the last six months, how is in the pattern of the pandemic and when you're treating the patients, uh, what kind of you know, experiences you had in the initial stages and how better it has become right now, right from the fear of patients to, you know, coming into an hospital or, you know, the cardio different syndromes you deal with in the cardiac, uh, you know, problems you deal with, if you can just give us a brief on that. So you are on mute. Yeah, so I guess we have been through very tough time and we are still going in a very tough, tough phase. Um, let's go down to the lockdown period. Uh, we, I can personally quote many examples where the patients died because of lack of medicine or lack of health care. There are patients who were in remoter areas. They just couldn't reach any health facility. They're close by nursing homes were closed. They used to call us. We used to say, please go to some hospital as close as you can. And they would say that it's closed. We can't do anything. They would try to come to us and never reached because there were, there were barriers. There was no transport. I came across one patient today who couldn't get the medicines and had a heart attack because he just couldn't get it. He was on a stand and could not get the blood thinning agents. It was a miserable time for heart patients during this lockdown. We were saying that we are stopping COVID deaths, but we were losing more uh, cardiac patients who were dying. So it was a very miserable story that happened that time. There was so much fear amongst people that they don't want to go to hospital even if they were having chest pain in, during that time. So the good change that has happened now is the patients are less fearful now. They are trying to visit hospitals. They understand that if they don't go with non-COVID illness, they may die from that rather than to risk a COVID illness. But what about those who are 75 plus? They find it so difficult because if they get COVID, the chances of a problem are high. Then our cardiac patients also will tell them that please don't come unless you have a problem. So it is kind of a very difficult situation from both hands that if we try to avoid the patients, they may end up in a mess. If we call them, what if they get exposed? 
but now the time passes one good thing has happened with covid uh, illness is that less patients are on ventilator less patients are dying there is more recovery possibly because of better drugs available possibly because of st some studies having shown uh, some of the drugs having worked in our uh, institute plasma worked well so remdesivir worked well so i guess the recovery rate with that has gone up and maybe some immunity in the community has reduced the spread but for the cardiac patients it's been a really very unfortunate time unprecedented we don't have an experience to handle these patients uh, we would our physicians would shy off if uh, somebody had chest pain and had ecg changes and has covid positive most of us had difficulty in treating them with angioplasty or something our system was not geared up so that has got better we have understood how to tackle covid patient with a heart attack we have put in protocols but it was a very rough and a tough time we are learning but still far 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 away from the truth we still have lot of patients of covid we still have patients uh, non covid problems and we are trying to balance out how do we manage okay uh, dr ganesh uh, if you could uh, add on to it like what was your experience and how prepared were you like initially when the pandemic arrived no one would, would be like prepared but you know, the protocols we have had have did you have uh, protocols for uh, you know doctors frontline health workers how streamlined this has become now uh, i mean i think uh, dr kerian and dr dalbir singh have uh, told what the problem is and all of us i think have a similar kind of a problem where in the initial days patients during the lockdown patients were not coming and they had their own problems in their home many were dying at home that was one issue from the patient perspective that has changed over a period of time that now i think they are deciding that in spite of covid they have to go and get treated the other perspective is the you know the healthcare perspective where uh, the healthcare professionals uh, were not sure how to take care of themselves because we knew so little of the disease in, uh, in february march april that you know one day there used to be news saying that it spreads by aerosol next day it used to say it spreads by you know fomites like uh, handles and lift buttons and all those things so nobody really knew what was happening and how to even protect ourselves so there was a lot of scare especially among surgeons that uh, you know you don't want to operate a covid positive patient and then you know spread it to your team and then everybody is in a problem so we took whatever at least in the lockdown there were not many patients to even uh, talk about you know we used to do maybe one surgery a month or two surgeries a month maybe six a month and we used to uh, take all precautions but operating with the pp is just as dr cherian said is an impossibility i mean any surgeon will vouch for it so you can't wear a pp wear loops and then operate for 3 4 hours it's just not possible so you have to just choose our cases currently what we are doing is we are testing them for uh, uh, covid with uh, rt pcr and if they are negative we admit them and take moderate precautions not pp but you know as respirators to n95 masks and go ahead with surgery things are getting better people are coming out but i think the risk of health personnel contracting with covid is far more real today than it was 3 months ago i don't know if the other panelists agree up with that Okay. Yeah, uh, Doctor O P Yadav, uh, coming to you. Uh, if you could uh, tell us, like, you know, uh, how it was uh, the past six months, the experience, uh, you know, uh, during the first lockdown when the pandemic hit immediately, and being an uh, you know CEO of the National Heart Institute, we leading lot of you know patients coming in and coming out. Right? So, what kind of infrastructure, uh, you know, changes also had been done in hospital? If you could just highlight. Doctor Opie, you have done your Doctor Opie. Uh, yes, thanks a lot. You know, a lot of things have been already said and endorsed. Most of them, you know, it was a double whammy. Both the patients as well as the medical fraternity, we weren't prepared. So both sides, and then on top of it, fear complex, lack of information, and misinformation more than the lack of information. in fact lack of information would have been a great thing we would have been neutral 
but having a wrong information was the uh, most important thing. And as Balbi pointed out, the mortality has come down. But I think the most important thing which has happened with mortality coming down is a change in our concept of the pathogenesis of the disease. See, earlier we took it as an acute respiratory distress syndrome, the ARDS of the high altitude pulmonary edema type. And we were going it for early ventilation, high pressure ventilation, full ventilation. And that's what caused huge amounts of damage. In fact, there is a study from Italy which came out when they looked at patients with no ventilation, oblique ventilation, and they found that the mortality was high on the patients, obviously, who were, you know, in the in the ventilatory era versus the non-ventilatory era. So today we know it is a thrombotic process and introduction of anticoagulants has changed a lot of it. Uh, as far as the infrastructure, you know, the first thing was more than the infrastructure, it was to build that confidence level in the staff itself, which was very important, you know. People were living, living, you know, in drones, uh, especially nurses from Northeast, because the hospitals in Northeast India, the government hospital, they opened up their recruitment portals. So all nurses working in a private sector in Delhi, earning half the pay they want to earn in a government setup back again at home, they all rushed back. So that was a big thing. How do we retain the res uh, human resources? And then training the human resources, giving PPE kit was not just sufficient. You know, how to use the PPE kit. And the positivity rate in the staff was extremely high in the initial six weeks or so. Infrastructure, we learned that, you know, collapsing walls, that term which has been used, is we what we fo follow, you know. We closed down the areas where we, you know, where we didn't have the patient totally and just created two areas, a COVID area and a non-COVID area, and tried to concentrate patients into these two areas. And acute care and chronic care were brought to some extent together to save the hospital resources. So those are the kind of uh, changes as an administrator we had to do, and probably all hospitals had to do. Okay, so uh, coming on to the next question, I would uh, like to uh, ask Dr. Dalvi first. Uh, um, like, uh, we are seeing a lot of research papers. Uh, kindly ask the other uh, you know speakers to go uh, mute. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a research paper in uh, from a uh, treatment center in Wuhan, China, which has shown that uh, you know those with CVD are at risk and that injury can occur for those with confirmed COVID-19. If they don't have even the previous cardiovascular diseases also, this research paper is saying they might get CVD disease if they are getting uh, you know, admitted during this process. Can you just tell us, explain, is this true? Or like, you know, these kind of lot of research papers are there and circulating. How much one should, you know, uh, believe this or not believe this, if you can tell Dr. Darby? So there are two things on this. The thing number one is that if a patient has a heart disease and now develops COVID, he's a high risk of death, um, uh, going on ventilator, clearly higher risk. There is no doubt about it. They also have other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, which add on uh, fuel to the fire in a coronary artery patient who's already got a stent or a bypass surgery and now develops COVID. So that's a bad news for any heart patients to develop. The second uh, important thing is to know whether COVID can cause a heart disease. Yes, it can. It is not as common because at max, we treated huge amount of cardiac patients, uh, patients with uh, COVID. And to develop a new illness with COVID from the heart point of view is possible, but not so common. So how, the, how do they develop a new heart disease? One is that uh, it is a thrombotic state. Now, since as we evolved and learned about COVID, we also evolved and learned that uh, heparin or uh, blood thinning agents are very useful and we give it to everybody. So one of the things that was happening was clot formation in the artery vessels. And this was leading to heart attacks. So this was one way uh, they were getting affected. The second way was in depression of heart pumping, which is cardiomyopathy. Now, there are various ways that a cardiomyopathy or low ejection fraction of the heart could develop in these patients. And one of the ways was a stress-induced cardiomyopathy in this patient. Third was development of myocarditis or the virus directly leading to some um, 
abnormalities in the heart. So there were multiple mechanisms on which uh, this COVID illness uh, could affect the heart. But predominantly, we understood very clearly that the major effect of this illness is on the lungs and forming clots. So we were on, on the watch to prevent clots and to prevent a lung disease. And we understand it better than we, what we understood in March or April. This is clear, March or April, even in May. It's clear that the understanding is better. Of course, as uh, Professor Cherian clearly pointed out, that is something new. You don't learn uh, about a disease in three months or four months. It is completely come out of a blue and hit us all hard. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. T.S. Clare, Chairman, PSRI Healthcare, uh, PSI Heart Institute has joined us. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in, sir. We had uh, uh, the discussion going on from six. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, uh, this thing, which I, I just asked Dr. Dalpi Singh ji. So uh, there's a lot of research uh, which is going on in, uh, in terms with COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. And there is a research paper uh, where the treatment center in Wuhan, China has shown that, you know, although those with CV, CVD are at risk. People who have cardiovascular disease, they are at risk. But when the people who are not having cardiovascular disease also, when they get admitted for COVID-19, they also develop such risks. So can you just uh, give me your pointers? Is this correct? Is this, uh, can patients develop so? And if you can just uh, add on your ways to it. Uh, Pratima, first of all, I must thank you for inviting me to this uh, rather wonderful, very important uh, webinar. And I also would like to say hello to Professor Chirian and Balbir and uh, Yadav, all my friends here. Uh, now, coming to the question of uh, COVID and heart, <clears throat> it has two way relationship, as a few points have been already enumerated by Dr. Balbir. His name is spelled wrong here, actually, he's Balbir, not Dalbir. Uh, one is that if a patient has a cardiac disease already, he is more prone to get infection. That's number one. Number two, his chances of complication and mortality are high. But let me clarify this. Heart disease is not a uniformity. Every patient heart disease doesn't have the same risk. We are talking about who have got a very significant uh, cardiac problem. For example, if a patient has a heart failure, if a patient has a low ejection fraction, if a patient had uh, you know, like uh, devices like CRT and devices like ICD. If a patient had an angioplasty, his heart function is normal, his blood pressure is controlled, he is not uh, at a really high risk uh, to develop COVID and complications from the COVID. So there has to be a dif uh, differentiation. Uh, but certainly uh, comorbidities like uh, any of these significant cardiac disease, like uh, even the respiratory disease, obstructive wave disease, the diabetes, elderly people, Anybody who's got immunosuppressed, like post-transplant people, because they are on immunosuppressant drugs. Anybody who's taking steroids, you know, uh, because they lower the immunity of the individual. So they are all high-risk group, uh, and they get more complications. Now, coming to the other side of the story, if a patient young, even like 25 or 20, 30, he can develop cardiac manifestation, and it has been seen that almost 15 to 20 percent patient of COVID. <clears throat> they have cardiac manifestation. Out of, out of those, predominant one is heart attack. So when we say heart attack, it is again of two types. One is the true heart attack. True heart attack is when, when a when a artery of a blood vessel, like a coronary artery, suddenly occludes hundred percent. If you have a eighty or seventy percent blockage, because COVID increases the coagulability of the blood. You know there is a more chance of clot formation. So over that blockage, you will have a clot and the artery will occlude suddenly, that will lead to heart attack. That is a true heart attack. Uh, and when you take these patients for angiography, you will find that the culprit artery is totally blocked and we need to open that artery. The second uh, thing which happens is that the people will come with chest pain, they will come with STT changes, the ECG changes, just like myocardial infarction or heart attack. But do their angiography, the coronaries are normal or no significant disease. Now, what is that? That is a pseudo heart attack. It is these changes are because of the myocarditis, the, the effect of virus on the heart muscle, uh, which is also called a myocarditis. That, that will be told. So, this is one. The second thing is these patients are more prone to get arrhythmia. So, you can have various kinds of arrhythmias like tachycardia, heart rate is more, 
or they can develop irregular heartbeat like atrial fibrillation and the most important thing is that which has been seen in in some patients with the patient is recovering you know we are all happy that patient is recovering and patient is going home and suddenly they had a, a cardiac arrest and they die so there is a more chance of development of malignant ventricular arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation you know in these patients so if a patient has recovered from a full attack of covid i would think that first uh, two weeks uh, one should be careful that they don't have they don't exert physically they don't do anything which is uh, out of the you know uh, regime advised by the doctors because these patients can get uh, arrhythmias uh, so uh, the third is that many of these patients they present with low pumping capacity of the heart that means low ejection fraction again it is because of the inflammatory process in the in the heart muscle uh, caused by myocarditis by the virus and these patients present with heart failure they will come with breathlessness and cough on lying down it's a typical story of acute heart failure so these okay. are the main manifestations of a covid on the heart okay dr cherry in your uh, thoughts on this saying sir like how uh, difficult uh, it is like you know if there is a a patient who doesn't have a cvd risk but when he comes to covid with covid 19 does he develop uh, cvd risks is there any chances to it and if if you could also touch upon uh, the usage of drugs uh, like the anticoagulants which are like you know does it help uh, in improvement in uh, you know in hospital survival in patients infected with covid 19 like you know if you can just uh, uh, give us a kind of uh, uh, you know comment on that now as i mentioned earlier at the beginning itself i don't have any experience with the treating covid patients uh, because basically i am a cardiac surgeon i do not that much but it is a question of indication for operation when will you operate how will you look after your uh, team and how to look after the post operative now those we have already dealt with now regarding anti diabetes this micro pulmonary thromboembolism was detected in bergamo and uh, that is after more than 50 patients died one patient had post mortem and there they found out that it was due to micro pulmonary thrombosis from that time only people started anti diabetic also it was found that those patients who have been on aspirin of course the the chances were little less now if you look into surgery again you can see that the thromboembolic phenomena has been detected by if you put a patient on a ECMO the need for anti-diabetic that is necessary that is also less it is all controversy that is why i am saying you know this is a new disease we have not made any protocol and the protocol from my experience that is my own wife from what i have seen is that do not ventilate these patients like any other patient who do not have i mean who might be having respiratory distress in them but these patients who have got long standing asthma that's a different question and you have to be very very anticipatory there if you go on increasing the peak positive pressure ventilation you can get pneumothorax patients could die from that now regarding steroids maximum dose given is 1 to 2 mg per kg body weight now 
that is not my field anyway i will not talk anything about that this is what i see and we are not at all we are taught we don't admit anybody we just close it so i, I can't talk about that but operating with all this stuff with you you know and uh, that is a very very difficult proposition i have not done it from what i have seen few cases my colleagues who have done it they say it is terrible they want to get out of it now post operative infection that is the other side now what happens to the cardiopulmonary bypass setup all these are a different you know cup of tea Oh, surgical, the surgical side. Yeah, there is nothing much for me to add except that the SOPs have to be made sure that, as I said, if you have got four theaters, keep the three theaters closed. Use only one. Then what happens to the key? How often you are going to change the key? That also comes. So you know this is a. new process now you might even ask what about vaccination everybody was expecting vaccination to come on 15th of august in the independence day we know that it never happens phase one phase two phase three has to be done now we also know that dna and it is not rna it is mrna and what is going to be the effect of mrna on the whole body system what are the complications so these are all these physicians who are sitting around they will discuss for me there is nothing to this going back to op yadav ji uh, sir uh, if you can just uh, give your thoughts on this uh, you know how uh, when patients come in without a cvd risk but i mean for you national art institute mostly they will come in but you do you uh, see how do you see the pattern like you know do they get uh, this uh, risk of cvd one n and also if you talk about problems which are associated with improvements in there you can you hear me now sir can you hear me now no it's getting streamed i the mangled sound i'm getting i'm not getting okay. clear sound doctor gadi I couldn't get Can your I question, please. Can I repeat the question? Can you hear, hear me now? Yeah, I was asking yeah. you, like you know, how do you see when the CVD uh, risks National Heart Institute will get only more majorly the cardiac patients only? But besides that, do you think the people admitted with COVID nineteen develop these uh, risks, new risks of you know CVD when they get admitted? How do you see this? Uh, you know pattern is this uh, you know correct does this happen from your experience in the past 6 months have you seen such cases and also on the anti coagulants which are used and the drugs which are used you know uh, the how does it improve like you know do we have correct you know information about the drugs which have been used and the devices which have been used if you can throw some light on that sure now first you know uh, by government regulations we are all medium and large hospitals more than 100 bed are required to take covid patients 20% so we are treating even general covid not only cardiac covid uh coming to that yes uh, this covid has affected the heart you know we heard uh, the direct effects of covid on the heart but more than what the virus does to the heart is what the body does to the heart itself see whenever the virus infects the body the body mounts an inflammatory response to limit the viral spread and to counteract the virus and that inflammatory response till a particular point is protected a protective and beneficial to the body but gone beyond a particular point it becomes harmful and today a lot of damage to the heart and the rest of the body is occurring because of the exaggerated immunologic 
early directed inflammatory response that a human body mounts. Also, you know, there is activation of these special constituents called macrophages, which, you know, they, 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 they dissolve the collagen uh, plaque and helps it rupture. So a hard plaque becomes a soft plaque, it ruptures and produces a full-blown heart attack. So there are lots of mechanism. And the third thing that I want to impress on is it's not just the acute damage. It is also the ongoing damage which occurs. Dr. Clare referred to, you know, athletes for two weeks. We just had a study of 26 competitive athletes at school level coming from USA, out of which four had, you know, MRI based changes in the heart. And obviously they were banned for competitive sports. So the changes are not just acute changes. The changes are going to be seen maybe six months later, one year later, and we can just predict whether the heart failure incidence then will go up or what will happen. Your last thing about anticoagulants, it's now a given thing that the anticoagulants have to be used. In fact, just day before yesterday, and this is the first randomized controlled trial. Till now, all data we have been getting is an observational data, but this is the first randomized controlled trial of just 20 patients, which has come up from Michigan, where they looked at full dose anticoagulation versus prophylactic anticoagulation. And there is overwhelming support for full dose anticoagulation. It is not prophylactic anticoagulation. And we must also realize that the newer oral anticoagulant agents are not recommended during the intra-hospital phase. It has to be low molecular weight heparin used in full dose along with high dose of aspirin. So that level of anticoagulation. And once the patient is discharged from the hospital, then the debate can be on what level of anticoagulation and for how long. But it is recommended probably for minimum six to eight weeks thereafter also. So anticoagulation is one of the most important thing which has changed the prognosis of this disease. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving on to uh, Dr. Yeah. Pratima, can, can, I Pratima, can I interview? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Yadav, yeah, yes. can, you, can you please elaborate? Uh, you know, the COVID patients are various grades. There are patients who have no symptoms at all. There, there are patients with mild symptoms. So what are those patients where you would like to use anticoagulation? Not in everybody. Am I right? Sir, I thought the question was asked for what do you do at National Heart Institute? So we are talking of hospitalized okay. patients. Okay. Hospitalized okay. patient, okay. the answer is 100% okay. anyway. of patients. Hospitalized patient, we are using for everyone, whether we're using right or wrong, but at least we use it for everyone. Thanks a lot uh, for that question and uh, the answer in between. Dr. Ganesh, quickly, your uh, points, uh, viewpoints on the same. If you could just add on to it and so we can move on. Yeah. Well, there is not much that I would like to add on except saying that I don't treat COVID patients myself. I'm primarily a surgeon. My only involvement with uh, COVID patients is when they call me to put ECMO on these patients. Uh, we have done a few of them. And I would just like to tell the panel and the rest of the people who are listening to this one interesting case. A young fellow came with uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, resuscitated, the heart came back and the family wanted whatever possible done. Uh, I'm talking this in terms of the coagulopathy that happens. We open cannulated the uh, femoral vein and artery and there was no blood flow no blood flow the entire femoral vein and the ivc was full of clot we could not get any flow so i'm just saying that we know so little about the disease that we are basing our treatment based on some paper here some paper in wuhan some paper here some paper there but i would like to humbly submit as a physician that i think we know very little about the disease. We are doing whatever we think is right from whatever information we have. But I think the information we have is far too little to make any uh, meaningful uh, inferences at any level. Okay. Now, uh, coming back to technology being used, a lot of technology is, uh, you know, uh, now uh, being used after this pandemic and since the lockdown, the telecardiology is actually 
uh, is increased and you know telemedicine has increased many fold and also other innovative technologies have come in place and i would like to ask dr balbir singh who has recently done a bluetooth pacemaker uh, uh, thing he had uh, placed this so that you know uh, the patient can uh, not come to hospital again and again visits of hospital is being like restrained so uh, dr balbir singh can you just uh, explain to us the advanced technology which has been done in max and how you know this can be taken forward such innovative technologies i would like to ask the other panelists also first from you like you know uh, yeah so the covid has taught us some new norms new normals which are going to last for a long time one of the new norms is like we are sitting on uh, online and chatting and the world is watching this similarly we had many medical conferences online which never happened in the in the past we never thought that this will happen we were introduced to a telemedicine which is uh, it's somewhat in infancy i would think we need some better tools to do it so fortunately for us on 29th february we did a a device uh, which is an icd with a bluetooth uh, this was the fourth implant in the globe and uh, the first in asia and uh, this implant uh, it was so simple for the family that they have not come for a follow up since then because they transmit all their reports from the icd which is like a, a counts every heartbeat every second every minute 24 by 7 and gives us a printed we can take a print out of what is happening from the home they just have to click on the mobile phone and collect the data and send it to us now we have done about 10 such cases uh, since uh, last 6 months every day is gratifying so we will see a huge shift happening towards online um, conferences people not traveling too much and this is not going to stop this is not going to stop even after the vaccine comes or even if the corona cases come down this fear is going to lag on for a long time and we'll have lot of improvement in the way the online um, things are done way the patient's telemedicine is done it is in, in infancy at the moment and this device is one of the uh, a clear indicator what we are heading for we are heading for patient sitting at home sending us data and we interpret uh, through our computers our mind so it is not to say that we are going to lose skills as a physician we are going to get sharper we are going to get better we are going to learn much more uh, different things than we ever did and this is very interesting field which is evolving now into this you know it some clinics have gone to uh, robotic surgeries done from off site uh, robotic angioplasty being done from outside so somebody is sitting somewhere else and uh, guiding the robot to operate some kilometers away uh, uh, which is also possible so we are going to have a major shift in how medicine is going to be practiced in the future and uh, it's going to be a great contribution from it and artificial intelligence which is going to take a huge shape in the next decade that is to follow okay thanks a lot dr balbir uh, i would like to uh, get uh, insights from dr ganesh krishnan from master uh, dr ganesh uh, what kind of innovations you have seen in this uh, you know uh, six months or you have been doing in master master is a big group so you must be doing a lot of innovations when it comes for you know cardiac sciences in particular any kind of innovations you are looking out for and particularly in tele cardiology and tele consultations how it has increased in many fold i i was going to come to it there, there are you know technical in innovations that one does i i, I think the greatest uh, contributor in terms of innovation to cardiac surgery in the country is sitting right with us uh, dr kem chari and he has got uh, hundreds maybe he has got a book this thick his publications uh, i'll come to to summarize this point 2005 they have started yes i know so he is yes, one of the greatest contributors and innovators you know he is uh, they are designing uh, uh, bovine pericardium so i would not go into those innovations i think uh, the innovations that we have come across is more out of necessity if a patient needs to consult me how do i talk to him safely how do i get him you know uh, not i should not get infected and he should not get get infected so i think the major innovation or i would not say innovation it has always been there i think it's just a application of a technology because uh, video conferencing was always there but we never used it to use to talk to patients because we needed to auscultate them we needed to check their blood pressure but we have done away with those things and just say oh how are you feeling are you feeling all right do you have any complaints 
and you know prescribe some drugs uh, over the internet so yeah tele consultations have gone up uh, now on an average about 50% of my patients would like to tele consult because they would not because most of them are bypasses or elderly patients they they are afraid to come to the hospital now we have to adjust to that and maybe uh, it's just my feeling that maybe this will be the new norm that many of them uh, would want to consult with you uh, on video or tele consult and then if necessary come for a uh, you know physical visit uh, i don't know what uh, dr dr yadava thinks about this uh, but this is how i think it will move and some of this tele consultation will be there to stay so i don't think i would call it an innovation of sorts but uh, necessity to continue with what we are doing and provide service and opportunity for the patients to communicate with us and get their you know problem solved okay dr ts clear uh, in psri what kind of you know uh, i hope yes tele consultations would be uh, happening for sure but uh, other kind of you know innovations in cardiac uh, uh, institute which is happening in the past 6 months if you could just highlight those please i think the uh, covid has really taught us so many lessons <clears throat> one it has shown us that uh, such a small microscopic uh, structure can bring uh, the whole world on its knees you know the covid doesn't bother about prime ministers home ministers of any country including the president of united states of america and covid has also shown one thing good that it doesn't bother about rich and poor people it is everybody is same uh, this number 2 is it has also uh, at least to me it has also realized that perhaps the health remains the most important aspect of life i tell people three things important in life are health health and health nothing else now coming to the uh, the, the telemedicine part <clears throat> i think there is no doubt uh, that corona has made us realize that, as, as ganeshwar said that the technology was already there but it has made us realize that it is so useful and it is possible i believe me that in cardiology 80% of the patients can be totally seen evaluated on tele cardiology they don't need to come and only 15 to 20% of the patient will need to come to the hospital for physical examination and for investigation somebody needs an angiography somebody needs a change of pacemaker he has to come but otherwise most of the other things can be sorted out by uh, telemedicine and i believe we talked about uh, the uh, bluetooth technology in fact that remote control devices for monitoring of devices have been there for uh, many many years more than uh, two decades uh, almost one and a half decade the only difference uh, with this new technology has made is that it is available on blue bluetooth technology on a cell phone previously we used to give them a additional box the patient will keep in his room and that will send the information to us that's the only thing which has changed so it has made the it is the necessity to buy a special equipment has gone away so that's a good uh, improvement but remote control uh, of devices was already present see i can tell you one thing that uh, i had almost uh, daily one or two consultations from bangladesh uh, i have had a consultation from chittagong cox uh, bazar uh, nepal and afghanistan so you can imagine the utility of telemedicine that people sitting in kabul uh, they can they can have a consultation right in delhi uh, and the problem can be sorted out at least in 80% of the patients i think that is going to be norm actually in the future in fact to my mind telemedicine is has much more relevance to india it's a huge country and there are people sitting in uh, uh, nagaland there are people sitting in mountains and if we have a technology uh, a lot of healthcare improvement can occur in our country actually the future lies in in in, in the e medicine the e health of individual very you know if i attended last year the tct meeting in california and uh, one guy from id was telling the futuristic uh, uh, things to happen in in medicine uh, there is going there are going to be small injectable chip which can send all the information to the doctor about that patient even it can predict uh, hopefully uh, that if somebody is going to have heart attack tomorrow or day after so lot of new things are going to come in in the uh, telemedicine and the e health is becoming more and more important the only thing which bothers my mind is that uh, in this 
you know, when a doctor touches the uh, patient, he he auscultates or he palpates his tummy. There is a personal touch. You know, that personal touch is lacking. Apart from that, there doesn't seem to be any any great disadvantage in telemedicine because the on video you talk to the patient, you can perceive the um, you know emotions and everything else is noted. But the personal touch of a physician yeah. is something which is a uh, uh, which is very uh, useful for many patients. They feel very satisfied when a doctor auscultates them. But uh, I think in future, uh, more and more patients will understand that st uh, the stethoscope is not needed in most of the patients. There are some patients even now, you know, like for example, they have hypertension. They will tell me, "Ke sir, apne stethoscope laga ke nahi dekhi." You know, they will tell me it was it was not needed. But patients do feel that personal touch is required in some of the situations. But I think we have come a long way, and in India. In fact, uh, we, the government should make more rules and regulations for the spread of telemedicine. Uh, how reimbursement is going to happen, and what are the legal issues involved if a doctor advises on the on the telemedicine? So all those things need to be sorted out uh, by the government in our country. Okay, Mr. Clear. Uh, Op. Adab ji, uh, uh, if you can just uh, talk about the daily consultations happening in National Heart Institute and how multi-flow just increased, and uh, you know your thoughts on the innovations uh, side also, if you could. Yeah. See, most of the innovations we heard actually, you know, uh, let me first uh, talk of the semantics. You know, telemedicine itself looks a very constrictive term and restrictive term. Telehealth is the term that we are talking today because it's much wider than telemedicine. Now, we, what we were talking is what we call the third level of telehealth with remote sensing and remote monitoring. But more relevant to India today is what we call as asynchronous telehealth. And that asynchronous is when the opposite side person is uneducated, he doesn't have the gadget to communicate with you, and he has a lower than a doctor's Qualification, qualified person, maybe a phys physician assistant, maybe just a technology-enabled IT person who can collect the information and transmit to the doctor. And that's what we are practicing. We had an MOU with the official MOU with government of Uttarakhand and in Almora in the Kumau Himalayas in the base hospital, there's a cardiac center. And we have gone up to the village called Supi, which is the second last village on the Indian side before the Chinese border. And we were able to collect Syn the, the, the asynchronous data, the local nurse there, not a nurse, a lady who was brought to National Heart for just three weeks, taught these things, sent back. She goes to these villages, carrying that small little gadget with her, and she records and transmits to us, and we transmit the information back, and then she goes and shows it to the people if synchronous telecommunication is not possible. Synchronous is when we have live one-to-one -one chat, she's assisting, but it's live one-to-one -one chat. But sometimes the systems, the broadband doesn't work, the telecommunication in these remote areas may not be good. Then the asynchronous ones comes in. So I think the country you know, needs these kind of innovations and that is going to take forwards because what we were discussing is all very limited number of people in the urban areas i think telemedicine is important to urban i'm not denying everything what's been said is important but equally we need to take it to the underprivileged in the in the backyards of the country thanks a lot dr Opiyadav. i'm coming to dr kane cherry and you know, who has introduced uh, in 2005 in frontier lifeline hospital tele uh, radiology telecardiology if i'm not wrong uh, dr cherry if you can just tell us like you know how it has been there yes as other panelists also spotted like it has been there teleconsultations has been there but this pandemic has given much more importance to it so if you can just uh, highlight how uh, this can be taken forward, this teleconsultations and this a uh, lot of other innovations which are coming and how should we take it forward? Dr. Cherin, you are on mute. Yeah, he has to unmute himself. I said, um... We started the telemedicine in our unit in 2005 mainly because 
we have another unit in a very small village in Kerala with a population of 7,300. And uh, nobody thought that, you know, that unit will pick up so much. Mainly because of telecommunicate, I mean, telemedicine first. And it may be of interest for everybody to know that we were the first one to use the satellite. Exclusive satellite when Dr. Abdul Kalam was the president. The third thing I would like to say is that we talk about robotics, robotic surgery, transatlantic robotic surgery. But to me, it is meaningless. The reason is this. I became a surgeon mainly because of the tactile sensation. I get thrill out of that only. If a robot does it, why the hell I should be a surgeon? I must be using the joystick. You know, I'm being frank about it. Definitely it will help the more places. We have connectivity with uh, Kerala, we have connectivity with Uganda, we have got connectivity with uh, Tanganyika. Now, leave alone all those things. Let us come to innovation. We have, we had, you know, our, uh, the biggest university, Nalanda, 560 BC. What is the, the state of Nalanda today? You know, Nalanda had 10,000 students and had 1,000 professors. Can you talk about Nalanda today? No. In fact, DST people, they asked me to do a workshop for them last October. I got Shiba International, Harvard and UTW to take part, including CRIB, that is the Korean Research Institute. We did the whole thing on, you know, uh, by virtual reality on a cloud platform. Now you know that it has come to augmented set, you know, reality. We have got 7,500 cardiac specimens. We are digitizing that so that it, you can pick up sitting in Delhi or sitting in uh, Assam or uh, China or uh, wherever it is. Now these specimens are available. That is again because of the technology. I'll tell you something more. If you are talking about money, 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 forget it. 2030 is going to be the era of bioeconomy. So get prepared for that. I won't be there. But be prepared for that. So talk about bioeconomy, talk about cloud platform, talk about uh, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, you can have all these things. Telemedicine will be very easy. You can have, I mean, give a lecture in Japanese, even if you don't know anything about Japanese in there, in Tokyo or Osaka or somewhere. So all these are going to happen. Now, when I did this for uh, Department of Science and Technology, at their request, after the meeting is over, two-day workshop is over, I did not even get a letter saying that, yes, you did a good job or thanks for uh, helping us. I was only trying to help that this science is possible in India also. Unfortunately, DST or TDB or CDSEO or you name all the organizations, I don't care about who listens to this. The support is zero. Absolutely zero. You people might get. Unfortunately, I am sitting in the south. Nobody even sees me. But I just want to tell you, all these are possible 
and make it possible that bioeconomy will be a success, a huge success for India. That's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, I uh, want to uh, again ask Dr. Kane Cherin to give. Uh, we are almost uh, done with that. the closing in the closing remarks. I would like to ask you, what do you want to? Uh, what are the lessons we have learned, like you know, from this pandemic, and what should the government do going ahead? What kind of you know uh, things, uh, the infectious diseases? The government should come up with an SOP, a guideline approach. For frontline health workers, for cardiac, uh, you know, please tell us a few pointers which the state government and the central government should do. Are you asking me? Hello. Yes. Yes, yes. Karen, sir. Yes. yes. If you are asking me, I'll tell you one thing. To be very frank, don't take it the other way. I have filed a PIL against the government of India. I know that, sir. 13 cases have been filed. None of these people will do it. <laughs> now because I am not waiting for a pension. I am not waiting for gratuity. I don't live on this. And government of India, after having me left my residence status in the US, in 1969, came back to this country, worked for 1,071 rupees. Nobody will do it. Recent status in two countries were left. I don't regret because you have called me here today. Otherwise, I would not have been called. At least, at least we, I can say that I did the first bypass or a lung transplant or a heart and lung transplant. That, is that has been possible only because I have been in India. Otherwise, I would not have been able to do it. So, as far as I am concerned, as I said, we have to progress. Think, look for 2030, which is going to be bioeconomic, because everybody talks only on that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Dr. Cherry, uh, Dr. T. S. Claire, your thoughts, what kind of, you know, um, uh, what kind of SOPs and protocols and guidelines should be made for infectious diseases, particularly in cardiac and should we have some and what kind of, you know, uh, things should come in place and how soon should, should it come from the state government point of view also from the central government also, your thoughts on it. Yeah, see, um, first of all, uh, I would like to share a case with my uh, colleagues, Dr. Cherian, Dr. Yadav, at, uh, which happened recently in uh, at Lugong Hospital. This patient came with the COVID and he had uh, uh, a clot in the right ventricle and this clot went into the lungs that causes pulmonary embolism. This patient was taken for uh, angiography which showed uh, also blockage in the coronary arteries. So the surgeon in the middle of the night uh, uh, did uh, they removed the clot from the right ventricle, removed the clot from the pulmonary artery, and they did also bypass surgery. This may be the first case of this kind in the whole world. The patient is recovering, but we don't know as yet whether he will make it or not. But I thought it, I could share with the Dr. Kirian and Dr. Yadav uh, such, such a unique case. Now, coming to the uh, question of uh, SOPs and policies, I think uh, uh, it should come from the Ministry of Health. You know, it is not something which, which should be at the state level. The government of India should make uh, uh, rules and regulations on a, on a country uh, basis of the whole, all over India. <coughs> the SOP is for telemedicine and the, in fact, it's not only telemedicine, as Yadav said very, very correctly, we should uh, now use the term health rather than just say telemedicine. Uh, there are a lot of things which will uh, uh, come in the future and I am very definite that the e-health is going to make the life of uh, an average uh, Indian sitting in a far fresh, far off place uh, will make it easy. So that, you know, one thing, this e-health uh, opportunity is such that it, 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 can, it can bring quality care, uh, quality health even to remote places, places, which is not so far available in India. For example, in Delhi, Bombay, there are five-star, six-star hospitals 
but you go 50 km or 60 km out of delhi there is nothing available you know neither there are uh, good uh, doctors nor there are facilities but at least the e health promises at least a good diagnosis for those people living in small uh, places but for that we need to first of all our improvement in the quality of these uh, uh, e health has to go much better we have to have a very strong broad bit or what are you know that's a technology which i don't know very reliable function uh, uh, it has to be developed maybe we can we have to have some separate channels for e, e health in, in, in india so that the it doesn't interfere with, with the uh, transmission of other data of other uh, departments so i don't know how to do it but certainly we need to bring in more legalization and more sops to develop the e health to a new level thank you dr clair dr ganesh uh, up uh, if you can just uh, you know uh, tell us like you know what kind of guidelines and things should be coming in in the future in infectious diseases if you could and look i i am not qualified to find on what sort of guidelines should be coming or what one thing i know for a fact is that there is a disconnect between the political system of the country and the ground reality the politicians do what they want which will get them more and they do what they do they want and i think as doctor why did doctor team really have to find a pi because there is absolutely no support for innovation and doing the right innovation so i like this one thing i don't even want to because people who make the guidelines is some bureaucrat who is being advised by some some people i don't know whether they are even qualified to opine so i don't want to even talk about it so i think i'll just <laughs> i'll keep quiet here see one thing i just want to add here ganesh uh, i i like your uh, way of putting the things in a very very sophisticated manner but let me tell you one thing that uh, it's very difficult uh, to be heard in this country you know whatever position you may have i am in delhi i am i have been at a scott heart and shoot for 28 years and uh, uh, you know i have treated uh, so called very big bbi person including the prime minister of india nobody listens in india tell you it's very difficult that we we can put across these things see now 75% of the healthcare delivery in the country is private medicine 25% is by the public sector but even the new uh, medical commission which has been formed there is hardly participation of any senior people or people of caliber from private sector so i don't know why this and i i have talked to the people who were responsible for making this but nobody listens here so that's the thing exactly what i'm trying to say yeah 80% is private healthcare 80% of research is from private places 80% of everything is private. Yes, 100% control is by government and by right. Babu who don't understand anything. Yes, yes. I don't know how things are going to improve. I mean, I'm I being very honest. Yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting when it comes private and government, but we have a time limit. So, Dr. O.P. Yadav, please, up uh, if you can just uh, let us know your thoughts. Yeah, one second, uh, Dr. Cherin, you have to make some point. Dr. Cherin, you have something to say? Yes. Yeah, please. Now, if you ask me to talk, I'll talk the whole day. I know, sir, but I, that's why I'm saying this is an interesting debate. If you can quickly make your point, and I want Dr. Opi Adams' viewpoint as well. What, what, what is there to say? You know, like Gane said, you know, who makes the rules and regulations? Now, I, I, you know, when people ask me, I say that if you have been lucky to have a resident status, qualified a job, please don't come back to the country. It's not worth. I'm telling you, after 40, 44 years, people like me doing it, you know, absolute out of stupidity. People call me mad. 
But somebody has to tell this. Somebody has to tell what is Nithya Yoga. Now, what funds you get for research? What is the interest rate? The banks, they say it is 5.5% or NABAR rate. But the banks would not give you for less than 12.5. Okay, I'll, sir. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get into all these things. Yeah, please. Let's keep yeah. it to World Art Day. So, yeah, uh, open, so you know, open your uh, final okay. thoughts. Yeah. No, yeah. You know, as a last word, let me tell you one thing. You want to please yeah. everybody. Now, Dr. Claire said he had treated two, three prime ministers. If I were in that position, I, I, I would have told the Prime Minister, this is not the way to go. But who will listen? Okay. Yeah, I am not sure. Sir, no one is listening. I have said it. Yes, sir. Please listen to me a little bit. Dr. O.P. Yadav, please, your final viewpoints on this, the guidelines. Yeah, my final viewpoint is, you know, if you have heard this name called Mary Lasker, See, when the cancer research was going on in 1930s and 1940s, early 50s, they were not making any headway. The industry was suppressing everything. It was Mary Lasker who was the frontline researcher, realizing that no one is listening to her. She gave up her research job totally and started rationing and doing advocacy. And it is her story that the most important thing in any research work is advocacy. So it's important that we as doctors, instead of gloating on the fact that we have not made any headway, we should be realizing our power and doing some advocacy, and then we will be able to march forward. As, okay. far, as, the, as far as the guidelines are concerned, my only request to the guideline making authorities is please make them relevant to the society that they cater for. You know, science cannot be uh, can't, can't be discordant to the society it's looking after. Now, recently we have a guidelines regarding recycling. Now, recycling has been made so difficult that in cardiology, no computers have been recycled now. Is that the in, that's the, the the interest of the country going to be made? So whatever guidelines are made, they should be relevant to the society. And I might like to differ with Dr. Claire. I think they will have to be made at regional levels because India is such a big country. Our cultural, religious, socioeconomic situation changes every 100 kilometers. And every state will have to come out with its own protocols. Thank you. Thanks, thank, thanks a lot to all the panelists here who have joined us for the World Art Day and giving their uh, giving your time here and we would just want to give you all uh, as a token of appreciation a speaker uh, certificate for you. Uh, I would like to ask my back-end uh, people to just put it uh, here. Thank you Dr. Kane, Jerry and Cardiac Surgeon Frontier Lifeline Hospital. Thanks a lot sir. Your uh, uh, Whatever insights you have was really good. Um, uh, Dr. Balveer Singh had to leave, so uh, we will give the certificate to him. We'll uh, send it uh, to him. He had some uh, OT. And uh, next is Dr. T.S. Clare, Chairman, PSRI Heart Institute, both. Dhanwad, sir, you might come. We're joined. Thank you. And Dr. Ganesh Krishna Iyer from uh, Astra CMI Hospital. Thanks a lot, sir, uh, for joining in early and coming and giving your thoughts here and our dear OP Yadavaji who always picks up the call in one drink for me and always says yes for webinar sessions. Thanks a lot Dr. OP Yadavaji. Thanks a lot for all the veteran panelists here. May meet you soon in next panel discussion which we'll organize. We'll let's take media keeps organizing and yeah, keeps doing a lot of good work. Hope you'll associate yourself with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.